Welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar on reducing jail populations through state and local policy coordination uh, with the National Association of Counties and the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, my name is Nastasia Walsh. I am the Associate Program Director for Community Health and Justice at the National Association of Counties, NACO, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, just housekeeping before we get started, just a reminder, this session is going to be recorded. Uh, we are going to make it available on the NACO website after the event. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box to pose any questions you may have throughout the conversation or if you're having any technical difficulties. Um, if you have questions for our speakers, we can address them during the Q&A portion at the end of the session. Uh, we're just going to jump right in. Uh, we have a really important topic for today's discussion and I'm really interested in, in hearing folks' questions and thoughts. Um, as many of you know, counties operate 91% of all local jails and spend about $26 billion each year on correctional facilities. But many of the laws and policies that determine who goes to jail and for how long they stay happen actually at the state level. So state policy can also help determine what is considered a crime, when to arrest someone, how to make a pretrial release and sentencing decisions and how to handle probation violations and unpaid fees and bail. Uh, lots of uh, that happens at the state level too. So um, we also know that state budget policy can dictate funding availability for mental health services and local communities. Um, this uh, conversation today is gonna share how uh, county leaders can partner with some of our state policymakers to consider policy policies that reduce jail populations, improve public safety, um, especially as we're thinking about um, how some of the congregate care settings, some of our jails and prisons have fueled the spread of COVID-19. So uh, we're gonna hear about an example um, of how this is done in the state of Michigan. Uh, this year, this partnership resulted in a historic slate of legislative changes to protect public safety and reduce jail populations. So we're excited to be here and hear about the work being done in Michigan and some strategies that you all can use and take home with you and some resources available to you to do so. So I'm going to turn it over to Terry Schuster with the Pew Charitable Trust to introduce himself and kick off the conversation. So Terry, I will hand it over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Terry Schuster from the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, I imagine a lot of you on this call have seen jail population growth over some number of years in your counties, or you had to rework your county budgets or do some serious fundraising uh, because jail costs keep going up, right? Um, that's not just a local phenomenon. Uh, across the country, the number of people in county jails tripled in the last 40 years. Uh, it grew by about half a million, which is a number that's a little bit hard to picture, but give you a sense of scale picture like the whole population of a huge city like Atlanta, Georgia, that's half a million people. Um, and when we control for inflation, local spending on jails rose sixfold, going from about $5 billion in 1977 to like Nastasia said, more than 25 billion at last count in 2017. And something I think a lot of you all already know is um, jail populations and costs have stayed high whether crime goes up or whether crime comes down. So for example, if, if we look just at the period between 2007 and 2017, we see that crime went down 20% across the country, but jail populations hardly budged and jail spending actually went up just during that 10 year period, about $3 billion. So today we're gonna to feature county officials from the state of Michigan who partnered with the state government to reverse this trend. And they had basically the same trend in Michigan that I, that I just described nationally. What they found um, when they looked closely at their system was people going to jail in huge numbers for nuisances, for debt collection, for low level crimes that didn't impact public safety. Uh, they found tens of thousands of arrest warrants going out for things like unpaid fees and missed court hearings. Uh, they found people staying on probation for a very long time and getting sent back to jail repeatedly for violating probation rules and pretty shocking numbers of people coming into jail with serious mental illnesses. The interesting discussion that county leaders had in Michigan that I hope you all on the call today will consider having in your state is, is this. Yes, the jails run at the county level, but jail growth is not 
the county's problem alone. It's partially state law that determines, like Nastasia said, what gets punished as a crime rather than infraction. When do officers have discretion to issue citations in lieu of arrest? How long do people have to wait before being seen by a judge? Um, state law determines when, when jail time is the right punishment as a sentence to impose, and the state budget is, is pretty important when it comes to things like how many resources are available to divert people from jail um, who have mental illnesses or, or other behavioral health needs. So in Michigan, county leaders said, if we want to bring down jail population numbers safely across the counties in the state, we need to get in alignment with state lawmakers about what jail is for and what it's not for. So we're gonna dig into that material a bit deeper with Jim Talon and Megan Kite. Um, so Jim and Megan, would you each introduce yourselves, take a minute uh, just in that order first, Jim, then Megan, introduce yourself. Sure, thanks, Terry. Um, great to be here. I am a former county commissioner, finished my 20th year, uh, the end of December this past December. Um, that's 10 terms in Michigan. Uh, I know it's from all those years on the commission and being at NACO conferences, it's different all over the country. Um, I served uh, a long time on our local mental health board and on our community corrections board. Um, and it was great to be part of this task force last year. Megan? Yeah, I'm Megan Kite with the Michigan Association of Counties. I'm part of their government affairs team here and uh, really focus on judiciary and public safety as well as health and human service issues. Um, and Jim also served on the MAC Health and Human Services Committee. He left that very important role out, but he was um, a great voice on that committee um, and how we, we kind of connected him with the, the task force that was eventually uh, created out of uh, conversations with Pew Charitable Trust and some of our state partners. So uh, we're very excited to be here today sharing what we've learned in Michigan. And Nastasia and Alana, are y'all seeing me or are y'all seeing Jim and Megan on the screen? Well, uh, we are seeing you, Terry, but we'll make sure that we see everybody. Thank uh, you. Okay, so first question goes to Megan. Um, as a voice for the counties at the Michigan Association of Counties, how do you make the case to state lawmakers that they should care about jail growth? Why isn't jail just the county's problem? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for that question. And I think both Nastasia and, uh, and you've mentioned this, right? Where some of those decisions can definitely be made at the local level and um, at the discretion of our judges and prosecutors and sheriffs. But of course, they have to work within the laws that the state policymakers set. And so really to have that conversation and have the task force launched as a partnership was critical. Um, and I think that, you know, as we try to sell things with our voice at MAC and, and our advocacy that we do here, um, this was something that I think really grew out of a, a grassroots conversation. Um, you know, our sheriffs, our judges had been talking to our commissioners and I imagine nationally for years now saying some of these people that are sitting in our jail should not be here. They need to be getting services within, you know, to address mental health issues that they have. Um, it's not safe for, for them to be sitting here. It's not safe for our officers or deputies that, that are working here. Um, and so you know, our commissioners had been saying this for a long time. We had a, a lot of voices from rural areas, um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, really concerned because number one, they didn't have a lot of staff to begin with and a lot of uh, folks in their sheriff's office. And when you're dealing with someone that maybe had to go to an emergency room that was two, three hours away, that means that officer couldn't be on the road uh, patrolling their, their area. So, you know, they, they were speaking loud and clear for a long time to commissioners and I think to their legislators, but everyone was trying to understand the scope of the problem and then really how to solve it. And at the local level, uh, we know we were pretty limited on resources, particularly in Michigan and some of these areas that just don't have a lot of uh, revenues coming in, maybe low property taxes, which is a lot of um, what are, what are, you know, uh, the county general fund is based off of. So, um, you know, we really needed to kind of 
have the statewide effort and a county state court partnership to move the needle and come up with hard, fast recommendations and say to the legislature, these are areas that you need to invest and this is why and here's the data to support that. So I think that, um, you know, the case was really made because of ongoing and, and long conversations that have been occurring for years and years. And then it was just, I think, awesome timing that, you know, Pew Charitable Trust came in and said, hey, you know, what's the temperature in Michigan? And the temperature was like, yeah, let's, it's time is now, right? And so we were really fortunate that that um, assistance was provided and all of those people were at, at a table talking about solutions. Um, and we found really in the state of Michigan that criminal justice reform is something that the legislature over the past few cycles here have really rallied around um, in a bipartisan way. So we for a long time had Republican leadership in the Senate, the House, the executive office. We had a, a super majority in the, the Senate by the Republicans. And so we've seen some shift. Uh, we've had the governor's office shift. Um, the numbers aren't as large as they were for the majorities. And so to have reasons to come together and, and agree to something in a bipartisan fashion has really been something that's been helpful in this conversation as well. The, yeah, I think that's kind of um, as far as, uh, you know, the reasons why the legislature should get involved here in Michigan, those are kind of some of the the main drivers behind it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Megan. Um, next question, Jim, you're a county commissioner. You worked on this state task force around jails. Tell us more about how you actually arrived at the recommendations for policy change and maybe some things like who was at the table? What information did you gather? How did the public engage? I first have to say what an amazing privilege it was to have been able to be part of this task force. The membership really included uh, diverse stakeholders, the Lieutenant Governor, the Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, representatives from both legislative bodies, our House and our Senate, and from both sides of the aisle, uh, law enforcement, both uh, local police and uh, sheriffs, county prosecutor, judges from local courts, victim advocates, a defense counsel, a mental health expert, and two county commissioners. There was some effort to balance the group geographically between urban and rural interests. I represented urban counties, my county having the second largest city in the state, and my fellow commissioner represented smaller, more rural counties. Like so often is the case, the key, I think, to addressing complex community problems is getting a diverse set of stakeholders at the table. And I think we did that. And that was really key to what we're seeing in some of the success of getting some legislation passed. We looked at data. We looked at a lot of data, mostly statewide numbers on things like, as Terry said, arrests, jail admissions, jail stays, court processes. Some things that jumped out fairly quickly for me were like the number of driving license, license suspensions being issued for non-driving offenses, the number of people in pre-trial detention because they're unable to pay cash bail. And of course, as has been mentioned, the number of people in jail who suffer from a severe mental illness. We took public testimony in several locations around the state. We also had a listening session at our Michigan Association of Counties conference. Um, we passed all that information on to the task force. It was very, very helpful anecdotal data. We heard a lot of um, amazing and surprising stories from people around the state. And then after all that information gathering and public input, we broke into subgroups to focus on specific areas. I think it was three different subgroups. Um, we processed the data, we talked about uh, possible recommendations, and then we came back together as a whole to discuss and eventually approve uh, a set of recommendations as a whole. It was a, it was a, a great, um, well uh, data sized process. Is that a word, data sized? I'm pretty sure it's a word. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then it, 
And just a quick follow up on on public testimony for Jim or for Megan, since you were at the um, the meetings too. any like testimony that just really stood out or that was really memorable people whose stories sort of like helped shape the policy package. Totally fine if you don't have something right on the <laughs> on the tip of your tongue. You know, I think I think some of the um, some of the stories about um, people uh, being in jail with mental illness, um, having that kind of those actual stories to support what what we saw in the data. Um, you know, there were a number of those kinds of situations, and, and that was helpful to hear. It's always helpful to hear um, the real stories of, of what's happening with people. Yeah, and I would just say, um, you know, I wasn't on the task force. I supported, you know, our members that served on the task force, but I did sit in a lot of the meetings. But I also think that it's important to note that there were public hear hearings or meetings, but there are also these groups that Jim had mentioned with, um, you know, Mac hosting kind of these focus groups and and you know, those occurred in different, uh, different settings and victims were also, um, you know, a subset of that. And so it really just focused on the entire, um, entire population that's involved in this from the victims, the families, the, those that have been arrested um, and looked at the full scope of it. So I think that was really, really helpful as well. Um, to look at the data and then the anecdotal evidence from all of those parties that are affected. I remember a, a judge coming and testifying. He was he had just retired or something, and he was talking about his years on the bench and what he had like seen and how he's just like I just think we were doing it wrong, you know. And, and I remember we were go, going and visiting um, one of the jails and with, with the chief justice, and she she met uh, like a room full of folks who were housed at the jail and this guy was like I've been here for more than four years pre-trial I have not been tried yet and I haven't seen my kids for four years and like and they haven't scheduled my trial you know like and that being sort of like it's really sealing the deal for her and being like we got to do something about this we have to change how long people are sitting around pre-trial um I'm gonna move on to the next question Megan um the jail's task force made its recommendations in January of 2020. Um, then curveball in March of 2020, the world changed with COVID. How did that change the conversation about reducing jail populations? Yeah, I think um, everyone on this call that's listening in probably had a similar experience because nationally, of course, jails were a, a huge focus. Um, when COVID occurred and outbreaks continued for, you know, the safety of those who've been arrested and our sheriff deputies and corrections officers. Um, it seemed like, you know, every other day um, an officer would contract COVID or an outbreak would be occurring. And so, um, you know, it became a huge focus. And of course, we saw a release of a lot of, um, a lot of people that have been ar arrested and that were sitting in our jails. Um, I think at one point, the Michigan Sheriff's Association uh, said that the jail's populations at that point were down about 50%. Um, you know, tickets weren't being given. Uh, it was just, a, and people weren't even on the roads at the time, right? And so it was just really strange. And I think that we were fortunate in a way to have these recommendations and data to look at to see you know, what do we do? Who can we release? How do we respond to this? Um, and almost have a roadmap. And, you know, I say we, we were fortunate. Everyone's in this horrible situation. Um, but at least we had something where we could, you know, look at or, or such a, a recent conversation to be had between all of these parties, right? I mean, we just had a year's worth of these meetings happening with sheriffs and commissioners and prosecutors and judges sitting across the table with the Lieutenant Governor and the Supreme Court Chief Justice. And to have all of that so fresh and new, I think really allowed us to respond pretty rapidly because you had those relationships, you had these lines of communication, and then you also had this report and these recommendations and data to support who could be released and, and how we can maintain safety because that's certainly a balance that 
you know, our commissioners and our law enforcement look at, right? We want to maintain public safety, but we also know that, um, you know, we don't want to be spending or, or wasting taxpayer resources when we don't need to. And if there are ways to lessen the burden on our, on our jail costs, then let's do that. And so we were almost kind of, you know, forced into this situation, but I think maybe for, for the best. And um, it maybe just accelerated this legislative uh, initiative that we had and these bills that we now have um, signed into law that have, you know, updated different um, uh, sentencing and, um, you know, ways that we look at probation and all of these different measures. But we were just kind of forced in the situation um, and accelerated the process. And so hopefully all of that can be helpful information to anyone across the, the country that's looking to um, address this in their county as well. So a lot of the actual policy changes kind of got forced through even before the legislature passed the laws, right? Like the, like the recommendations were made and then locally everybody's scrambling, like how do I, how do I like manage this crowded jail population right now? And then yeah. we had a little proof of concept almost but for the legislature that was considering the bills. Yeah, and I, well, I do think it's important to, to know what I mean. 100% agree with that, but I think um, when the legislative process still occurred, we still had that process, right? And we were still doing this remotely where, um, you know, law enforcement was meeting with legislators. Uh, I think three or four different drafts of different bills came through. And it's not like anything was just, you know, rubber stamped and everyone said it was okay. Like there was still a process and we did this virtually and we did it through a pandemic. So if we did it through a pandemic, <laughs> um, we can hopefully, uh, you know, give the tools to everyone else to do this and hopefully it in, you know, person. <laughs> and in an election year, it was uh, in a national election year anyway. Um, okay, so back to Jim, the legislature passed 20 bills. Uh, which is probably more than we can talk about today, but maybe could you pick one or two of the changes, discuss um, how you think they'll make a difference locally? Sure. You know, we saw lots of data um, in the process that indicated that minor traffic violations land a lot of people in jail. Um, just minor stuff that really, you know, parking, um, you know, just, just minor stuff. And, and the new laws passed by the legislature decriminalized several traffic violations and expanded the ability of officers to issue a citation instead of arresting people. We heard a lot of, we had a lot of discussion about that, um, that um, officers need the ability to, to issue a citation so that rather than to take somebody right to jail for, um, non-threatening kinds of violations that aren't, aren't a danger to, to people out on the road or, or on the sidewalks. Um, and one of the changes in the law that just went into effect this month has to do with driver's license suspensions. For tens of thousands of people in Michigan who had their driver's licenses revoked or suspended because of un unpaid fines and fees, their driver's licenses are being reinstated. And moving forward, licenses won't be suspended for issues that have nothing to do with dangerous driving. That's a really big deal. People need to be able to drive to work and live their lives. And frankly, if you have your driver's license taken away for not paying child support, how are you supposed to get a job to earn money to pay your child support? Because of this recent change in the laws, state laws, we should see far fewer people going to jail for driving on a suspended license. And I, and I need to add there that um, I had hoped to be able to find some data about what's happening as a result of that now, but it's really a bit early in the process um, to be able to have, have good data on that. But um, based on the past data, we can certainly expect that this kind of an intervention is gonna have a positive effect long-term. Another recent small step forward was a $5 million grant fund that the state set up for counties. It supports crisis intervention and diversion from jail for people with mental illness. Half of this money is earmarked for services and supports in rural counties. 
and it can go toward things like crisis stabilization centers, telehealth contracts, partnerships between police and mental health service providers, whatever the local community needs to land fewer people in jail with mental illnesses. Having spent 12 years on our local county mental health board, this issue was hugely significant for me. People with mental illness rarely get better in jail. Yet the task force found that one in four people entering our jails met the threshold for serious mental illness and rates were even higher in rural counties where they have fewer jail alternatives. So $5 million um, is a step in the right direction. We need, as, as Megan mentioned, we need a lot more mental health um, services in Michigan are significantly underfunded. Um, but this is a great step in the right direction. And hopefully um, seeing some good impact from it will, will help convince legislators to uh, continue moving in that direction. Okay, Can last we, question. Oh, yep. Sorry, if I could just add, um, because I think something Jim pointed out was, you know, one of the recommendations when we looked at the driver's license suspensions and why people are having their driver's license suspended when it wasn't even related to driving and one that when we talked about it at our um, various tables with county commissioners, you know, the fact that someone was going to have their driver's license suspended for non-payment of rent or non-payment of child support, um, you know, people will just like oh my gosh, I know someone that had that happen to him. It just doesn't make any sense. So it was so relatable for county commissioners that talk to their constituents every day. And then having that conversation with legislators like, oh yeah, you know, why would they do that? And so it was all of these recommendations that came together. And then when people actually looked at it and talked about it around a table, it was, you know, these, the storytelling that kind of happened um, and it became very relatable and it became kind of just, uh, the easy messaging almost with the legislature because everyone could say, I knew someone in this situation and it didn't make sense then. And, you know, it doesn't make sense now. So how do we fix that? And how do we come to these solutions? And that's what a lot of these recommendations and these changes in law got to at the end of the day. So I just thought that was a good point to, um, to highlight. Yeah, I think, I mean, jail data is hard to come by at the state level, right? Like at the county level, you know, you can, you can, um, take a look at your own jail, but to try and get some sense of like what's happening statewide, who's going to jail. Um, I think, you know, the, certainly the members of the task force were surprised. I think the whole public was surprised. Anybody who was watching that like the third most common reason people went to jail in Michigan was driving on a suspended license. Uh, you know, it, it's not assault, a domestic violence. You know, it's not like um, drunk driving, the things that people are like really very concerned about and should be, it was like, oh, why are so many people going to jail for driving on a suspended license? Well, maybe we should look at why are we suspending licenses? So that um, that conversation, uh, maybe it applies to some of you who are listening on the call today. Maybe you have some sense of what, uh, what your laws are um, around that. I think just in the next couple of minutes, wanna get kind of a last word from, from Megan, from Jim, any other thoughts or takeaways that you think is particularly worth sharing with this audience today? Sure, I'll start with a couple of things. And one of them just, just came up and I'm a, I'm a data guy. And one of my concerns um, that I tried to advocate for on the task force was uh, setting up data systems that can track the, the outcomes, the results of these changes in, in law and in processes to see what difference it's made. It's, I think it's really important to be able to track that somehow. And as Terry suggested, it's hard to pull that data together. Lots of counties have it, but we don't have it on a statewide basis. So I'd certainly um, encourage uh, some focus on that where, where this happens in other places right from the beginning that if we really wanna see the impact of those changes. We have to have some data system, better data systems and coordination in place to be able to see those outcomes long-term. I think that's important. Um, you know, there's a, a growing body of evidence that shows a correlation between pre-trial detention and future negative outcomes like like reoffending and, and various negative social and economic outcomes. The evidence suggests that people who don't 
have to go to jail pre-trial actually do better in the long run? That was a piece that really surprised me um, uh, to learn and something that I think we need to continue to think about as we go through processes like this. Um, and then as is the case with so many situations in our society, poor people and people of color end up disproportionately in jail. We need to keep that data about this in front of us and continue to look for ways to address those disparities. And then related to the um, um, to what's been discussed previously, cash bail reform bills were just uh, introduced in our legislature, as Megan knows. Um, they would put in place a more structured process for bail decision making, reserving detention for people with serious offenses or those who would pose a public safety or a flight risk. Those are the things we kept talking about, public safety or flight risk. That's why people should be detained, not for all these other, other small things that um, really aren't helpful in the long run. Those were my kind of observations. Thanks, Jim. Megan? Yeah, you know, I think, um... Tim hit a lot of really great points, and I would just encourage um, other county officials to really start having conversations around this um, if they haven't, um, and really try to come together with their statewide partners and uh, their courts and all the law enforcement uh, groups that have um, that touched this this conversation and and pretrial and and um, jail issues. Um, you know, I think that in Michigan, we are having a lot of conversations around investment and behavioral health. Um, you know, I the time is now, right? Everyone's seeing a ton of federal dollars come down. Everyone's trying to figure out how do we spend this at the county level, the state level. We've been trying to, as an organization, really rally with other um, with other local partners, have meetings with the state to talk about where we can really make um, these dollars stretch and where that investment can really grow. And it's, you know, launching some jail diversion programs or investing in our specialty, specialty courts. It's expanding these, these efforts that we know really work and make sure that people are getting the right services they need. So I think um, if you've been thinking about it from a county level, if you don't even know where to start, please, you know, look at these resources. Um, get the assistance that's available, grants that are available, because I think, you know, you don't want to wait and, and miss an opportunity, particularly when there's just so, so much um, data and information from our state that I think can be really used and leveraged, um, you know, across, across the nation. And I think um, a lot of investment can be made in this area um, in upcoming years. So we're really excited about what we're doing here. And I think, um, you know, hopefully it can be helpful to everyone that's that's watching. And if anyone ever has questions about what's my, what happens in Michigan or what's going on in the legislature, uh, please always know you can reach out to our association. Yeah, and speaking of money and resources that are available, we're going to hand the microphone over to Heather Tubman Carbone, who's from the Federal Bureau of Justice Assistance. Uh, Heather, are you there? I am here. Can you guys hear me all right? Awesome. Always good to be associated with money and resources. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much, Terry. Um, I'm Heather Tubman Carbone. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Um, what you all just heard from Michigan is an incredible feat, to say the least. Um, it requires a Herculean effort on top of what is already on everyone's plate with regard to analysis and coordination um, and all the other necessary activities to to effectuate something like this. Um, and it's really, I, I don't want to, I'm not sure what the right words are. In, in some sense, it's almost like and the, the work has only just begun because now it all has to be implemented. You know, the, the work never ends. Um, but, so to Terry's point about funding and resources, um, NACO and PU generously invited BJA here to talk a bit about the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, uh, because it does offer one opportunity for states and the counties therein to pursue this and other types as well. The Justice Reinvestment Initiative is a public-private partnership 
between the Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs Bureau of Justice Assistance, say that five times fast, um, and Pew, nice and easy. <laughs> we fund the Crime and Justice Institute and the CSG Justice Center to provide intensive technical assistance to states. And at its core, JRI is a process. It is a vehicle. It is one that more than half the states in the nation have used to identify, unpack, and tackle their criminal justice challenges. They use data um, and engage stakeholders to understand what's going on, what's working, what are the pain and pressure points in the system, and what policy levers can we pull or practices can we change to make a more fair, effective, and efficient justice system. Now, you'll notice that in that sort of litany of adjectives, I did not specify a particular problem or a particular solution. That's intentional. Again, if you walk away with one thing or two words from this, it's JRI's a process, it's a vehicle, it is not a prescriptive solution. So we've heard from you from counties and states across the nation that policymakers are grappling with a unique combination of public safety challenges. So this includes people who have substance use disorders and mental illness in the justice system, uh, high rates of recidivism, the high cost of corrections, that's always on the list. In fact, that's the origin of, of this program. Um, all while trying to improve services for victims and increase opportunities for people returning to communities from jail and prison. The more than 35 states that have participated in JRI so far have saved or averted more than $1 billion um, and invested half that amount in strategies to improve exactly those types of system outcomes. And what they do and how they do it again really depends on their needs. Now, I'd be remiss not to clarify that JRI is generally a state level initiative. That is, applications are considered from the state level. And it can do incredible things for counties therein by looking across the state at how resources are deployed, how policies are implemented, how practices are consistent or varied, and what those things mean for case processing and criminal justice outcomes. To be candid, gone are the days where the person sitting closest to the decision maker should be influencing the decision maker without data in their hand. So that is part of what JRI can do is it can come in and it can look across counties as you just heard in Michigan, scooping up all this typically silo data and figuring out what will work best for the state and for the counties therein. So here's how it works. I'm gonna to try to boil this down without using slides. So think about JRI as two phases and the first phase is like R&D, it's research and development. We fund the technical assistance team to come into the state and to conduct agency spanning data analysis to understand who's coming into the system, why they're coming in, for how long, what are their needs, what resources are available, and to what end. So across the jail, across corrections, across relevant public health agencies, if that's a question that you have, across communities, whatever the relevant data are, that's where we go. And again, we recognize that's why this program exists, that you have jobs already. Your systems are already stretched thin. So that's why this program is here as a resource to come in and our TA providers work hand in glove with you. They staff your state. They are your partner to help understand what you need and accomplish it side by side with you. They will collect data that is, as I said, often siloed and underanalyzed to spotlight the most pressing trends and drivers of crime, recidivism, and very importantly, costs in your state. We also meet with a wide range of stakeholders, everyone from law enforcement, sheriffs, jails, to prisons, probation, parole, victims, advocates, community members, to understand their experiences and also to understand the data. The numbers often don't tell the full story. Unless I leave out courts, I somehow skipped over prosecutors, defense, and judges, and the entire court system in that, that list there. Um, and then we deliver findings and recommendations to state leaders and stakeholders, and it's all publicly available information at that point in clear, compelling, and actionable presentations. And then we sort of back off, and it's really up to you. It is up to the people in the state who invited us in to then determine without us whether and what to codify. And you can do that through in this very state to state, um, through legislation, through administrative uh, policy, through court rules, whatever the appropriate mechanism is. And our recommendations from our TA providers will typically include, um, will include that. And if you do pass things and you do codify them, we will always hope to see you back for a request for phase two assistance. Phase two is implementation. And as we often say, phase two is where rubber meets the road. So now you have passed 
those bills, you have codified that legislation. And in JRI, that typically means, and as you heard from Michigan, now you've got jails across the state who all have to do something in a coordinated fashion. It is, I was going to say it's more difficult than it sounds, but it sounds pretty damn difficult. Um, once those changes are adopted, that's, that's the challenge that implementation TA helps you face. And at that point, BJA can also make funds available to the state to support implementation. We see it as seed funding um, because we know that there are going to be some upfront costs. Now, before we wrap, I want to give you a sense. I know I've said that, you know, we don't focus on a specific topic. It's really up to the state's needs. But I do want to ground this in something concrete. So I want to give you a sense of the range of things that JRI can accomplish at the risk of you having to listen to me talk for a little bit more. So while I cannot emphasize enough that it's a vehicle, that it's a process, JRI has resulted in significant and cost-effective public safety improvements across the country, such as expanding access to substance addiction treatment and other programs proven to reduce recidivism for people on supervision, improved accountability at less cost um, with swift and proportionate responses to violations of supervision, I'm sure everyone's seen the research that Pew in particular has been supporting that talks about how violations of supervision are a major driver for prison admissions. So again, when I say JRI is also looking at cost, remember corrections, and, and I realize in jails, in, we're talking about jails for counties, um, but corrections is typically the biggest driver of a state's budget. So we, we have to talk about cost when we talk about criminal justice uh, resources and policy changes. Um, JRI has also seen double digit reductions in recidivism rates due to investments in smaller supervision caseloads, in training, in policy changes, and prioritization of prison space for people convicted of the most serious and violent offenses, thus averting prison construction and or reducing prison overcrowding. To give you two more even more specific examples, and here's where I really want to show you the state and local nexus. In Arkansas, they realized that behavioral health calls were consuming a, a more than significant share of criminal justice resources and to unsatisfactory outcomes. Law enforcement had no choice but to take people to jail. And exactly as you heard Jim say earlier, that's not great for the system and it's really not great for the individuals who are in crisis. Arkansas established crisis stabilization units in four or five locations across the state. And then they mandated crisis intervention training for law enforcement so that they would know how to use those units. They then went a step further and opened up referrals for those units to come from any public health um, organization or agency in the state, thus reducing the burden on the criminal justice system and placing individuals' health needs in the hands of those who are most capable of sufficiently addressing them. They have seen a reduction in recidivism among that particular population. The last example is in Louisiana, where half the state prisoners are held in local jails. The Justice Reinvestment Initiative data analysis in Louisiana identified that individuals who were held in local jails were not able, sorry, people who were state sentenced and held in local jails were not able to access reentry services because they were not funded for them in the local jail. The, the sort of extent to which this was happening was unknown until they did a comprehensive data analysis as enabled through JRI. Realizing they needed to fund these services, they also said, well, we've got to find money in the budget. So they had to identify places in that sort of resource pool where they could reduce in one place and invest here in this other one. And they identified a formula wherein the state DOC could provide funds to local parish jails to provide those reentry services to people who were returning to their communities. So again, JRI can provide a fantastic and absolutely data-driven vehicle, data-driven and consensus-driven, consensus-building vehicle um, to figure out how state and local agencies can work together. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up here. I'd love lastly to just point you towards a few resources. If you find um, a moment while we finish up here, there should be a link in the chat box to the BJA JRI webpage. It includes a few of our recent publications. A few in particular might be most useful. We recently published what we call a JRI guide with the Urban Institute. That one explains how JRI works. It can take you sort of behind the scenes of the initiative is how I think of it, and give you a sense of what's expected of states or agencies therein and what can be gained at each step. There are also a few topic-specific documents like community corrections. 
The best thing to do, though, if this is of interest, is to get in touch. You can get in touch with me. You can get in touch with Pew. You can get in touch with RTA providers at the CSG Justice Center or the Crime and Justice Institute. And we hope to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather, for that um, really comprehensive look at like how JRI works um, and how folks can work on that. So thank you. We did have a, a quick question, and then I have a, a question for you, Megan, as well. But um, Heather, can you just clarify? So who has to apply? And it looks like Michigan had a joint request, but who has to apply? Can a state association of counties apply or other state by state organization? Is it the, the governor? Like who's who's applying for this? It's a great question. Um, so, and it, it sort of happens as a process. Um, ultimately, though, the formal application is a letter that we require from, we call it tri-branch bipartisan state leadership. And so that is the governor's office, the chief um, judicial official in the state, and the heads of each party in the legislature. Now, Depending on the nature of the project, there are sometimes other people who would need to be involved. For example, um, if it were a jail project, we might say, oh, well, the, all the jails whose data we need might need to also sign on to a letter because the reality is we can't help you solve a problem if all the relevant parties are not willing to come to the table and share the data. That's the official answer to the question. It's, it's a little cart before the horse, though. I know it sounds really big. That's never where we start. Where we start is somebody in the state like the Association of Counties raising their hand and saying, or some one person in the legislature saying, hey, we've got this problem. I think, I'm not even sure this is actually the problem. We just need help. Or, hey, we're about to build a prison, but we're on this, like we're projected to keep growing. This isn't gonna solve the problem. We, we just need to pause. We need someone to come in and help us sort through this. And then we have a conversation and a presentation with a TA provider about what this process can do to orient more people in the state to it to see if it would be the right fit because it is I would argue it's it's a long-term commitment it's not it's not a dating relationship it's it's at least a first marriage um, and so it's it takes a little bit to get to this point and we go through an assessment that can take a few months just to make sure it's the right fit um, so don't be intimidated by the description of the letter and who has to sign it is really what I'm saying Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And we did put um, Heather's contact information in the chat. We will be sending all of these links out um, to everybody who registered for the for the session. Um, Megan, we did get a question for you in the chat. So um, you had mentioned uh, grassroots origin for some of the Michigan reforms. Did you all involve any people directly impacted by the justice system in your process? And if so, um, how how did that look? How did they inform your elected officials, judicial officers? How were they? How were their voices taken in consideration? Yeah. So when I had mentioned that, I think it was in, in relation to Carrie's question about how do we get the legislature to really look at this issue and and make it a state issue. Um, and and yeah, the answer to that was it was kind of already occurring because so many conversations were happening at that local level and and stories are being told of someone sitting in jail for months and months and months and, and not being able to get the treatment they need maybe um or they were you know waiting for a screening or a certain evaluation um and you know we were just so backlogged here and so those conversations were happening at the local level and so we needed to go to the legislature and say um this should be a priority we need to rally together and we need to make sure that uh, these issues are being addressed and that our jail populations, um, you know, are being, are being data driven and we're looking at reasons why people are being arrested. Uh, you know, that's kind of how that conversation really started. And so from the state white association perspective, we kind of just had to, you know, go in and, um, you know, say, Hey, you guys have all had these conversations. Let's really make this a state county partnership. We have few charitable trust here to provide assistance. Um, dig into this data for us and really push that message. So I think that's what I, I was talking about um, as far as that kind of grassroots roots initiative. But of course, you know, during the process then with the task force and Jim and, and Terry can probably speak better to this, but um, directly impacted individuals were at the table. They had those public hearings. They had these focus group sessions uh, all over the state, right? It was kind of this uh, 
you know, road tour that we did across the state so that uh, voices and those impacted from rural Michigan and uh, the UP and then from West Michigan and Southeast Michigan that has very different demographics, um, you know, it was all heard, right? So absolutely, that was part of the process, but I'll give it to, to Jim or Terry if you want to chime in um, on sure. that, feel free. Yes, yeah, so the... Oh, Jim? I would just add that, um, you know, we did, I think you mentioned this, there was hundreds, there were hundreds of people that, um, who were directly impacted, who spoke to us directly. Um, there were also a couple of organizations represented on the task force who advocated for people who are directly impacted and, and were very passionate about that work. Um, so uh, there was also that. Um, yeah, those, those two pieces I would add. Yeah, the way that the membership of the task force came together, um, it would be like the Michigan Association of Counties shall nominate, you know, like two county um, officials and then, you know, enlisting other sort of like categories of folks who would get appointed. And what the, the governor requested was that the, the state indigent defense commission nominate someone who themselves was formerly incarcerated to sit on um, the task force. There was um, somebody who was appointed um, uh, as a business leader who was a formerly incarcerated person himself. There was another person who was appointed um, as a, um, a pretrial services um, representative who, um, uh, who provided all sorts of community services to, or his organization provided community services to folks in Detroit, but who also like her parents were incarcerated and she spoke about that. So there were definitely sort of um, people who had equal voting power with lawmakers sitting on that task force who sort of showed up with that lived experience. And there were um, like, in addition to, you know, we would sort of take uh, kind of a road trip together and all show up in Traverse City and then all show up in Grand Rapids and then all show up in Detroit and all show up in Lansing to listen to members of the public in different regions of the state. There was um, one kind of, not exactly a hearing, but sort of like a testimonial day that was organized by um, formerly incarcerated folks where they invited the task force. They're like, no, this is our event, not yours. <laughs> they invited the task force and they sort of like ran the stage and, and invited people up to speak. And they were like, you're here to listen. And, and um, so there, was, there were sort of lots of opportunities. I think that was kind of one of the things that I'm sure stuck with um, decision makers more than a lot of the data. That's all the questions that we have in the chat. Any closing remarks from folks before we sign off a few minutes early? Thank you. Thanks, Nako, for having us. Um, it's always exciting to be able to talk about the good work happening in Michigan. Um, I feel like sometimes we get, you know, the media out there and there's not such good reports, but I, I promise there's a lot of good work being done across the state here. So we're always happy to share that. I'll add my thanks to, to NACO for supporting counties. Um, I've been a member for many, many years and always appreciate the work that, that comes out, out of uh, NACO in, in Washington. Thanks everybody for joining today, for real. If you think you could wanted to do some kind of project like this yourselves in your state, get in touch with Heather, get in touch with me, reach out and say like, hey, we wanna do this. Who do I need to talk to next? And, and let's have a conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you to everybody for joining today. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you on a future NACO webinar. Thanks.